Hey guys, welcome to the Real Time Web Series. You're listening in to Burst GVAC TMD from New Zealand. We have been on a bit of a hiatus, but we're back with episode 12. In this episode, we have two special guests with us, both of which are international, but currently residing in New Zealand. Along with me today is Murdoch, who you guys might remember from 12 Ounce Profit, and today we're interviewing 3D graffiti writer Kazam. So for all our viewers tuning in for the first time, the real-time web series is an in-depth process video meets podcast. Each episode basically documents the creative process of graffiti writers from start to finish and is then combined with the questions asked by our online audience. But before we get into it, I'd just like to introduce and welcome my guest. Hello, uh, I am Murdoch, ex-writer for 12 Ounce Profits, uh, the VNA magazine uh, blog and Bad Mag from Birmingham. And I'm Kazam. Welcome guys. So let's get straight into the episode because we've got some incredible questions uh, and I'm looking for some really awesome answers which will hopefully be really insightful for our audience. So I guess delving into your background and history first, how did you choose the name Kazam? So I chose the name back in around 2003 or 2004 and my main motivation to choosing the name was about letter combination uh, so I really wanted a Z in the middle uh, for the symmetry of it uh, and then I wanted that surrounded by an E and an A because you can write both of those three ways uh, and then I've had a name before that has had an M on the end uh, and so I like that on the M and then I just found a letter that was good up front uh, and then when I um, actually heard it being sounded out is when I really fell in love with the name. So people don't say Kazam, they typically say Kazam when they say it, right? So it has that kind of ring. Have you written any other names? Yeah, I've written quite a few over the years. Um, I've probably burnt through at least 20 names easily. Um, some more I've been more consistent with. Uh, others have been just sort of one-off random things that I've sort of painted. Um, some of the more often used names back in the day were, so I was writing spam for a while. Um, I used splur quite a bit uh, and a bunch of others, but they were more random. Oh, that's awesome, man. So having gone through so many different names, how long have you actually been writing for? So I started back in 1989 uh, was when I did my um, first piece um, with the help of, a, of an older graffiti writer who lived in my neighborhood. And then there's been a couple years on and off here and there, but otherwise pretty constant throughout. So given that you've been writing for such a long time, uh, why did you start painting graffiti? It was that um, older writer who was up the street from me who just sort of exposed me to it um, and sort of gave me my first marker and stuff. He actually, I remember he gave me a pilot flow pen, uh, what we used to call a pilot flow pen. And I was just hooked um, once I kind of understood what it was about or had someone sort of explain it to me. Where did you actually start writing and um, what was the scene like when you first began? So I started in Melbourne, Australia. It was a good scene in the sense that most of it was happening on trains. So it was a lot of bombing insides, it was a lot of track sides. Um, that's where most things were happening. Um, I guess the downside to it was, you know, I would say there was a lot of knuckleheads in the Melbourne graffiti scene at that time. Uh, but I guess that's a kind of common problem with uh, graffiti writing in general. So, uh, obviously, you then moved to New York. Uh, that was quite a big move coming from Australia. What motivated you to go to uh, New York and then later on back to New Zealand? So, the move to New York and the United States was essentially work-related. Um, I did my PhD in the US and that took about uh, seven, seven years perhaps uh, and then moved to New Zealand essentially for uh, a job. I also know that you rep represent a crew from New York, is that correct? Yeah, there's actually been quite a few crews from New York. Um, I don't put too many too many of them up uh, anymore. Um, 
just because I don't really sign off on pieces all that much these days. Um, but I think the first one from New York being put down in was actually TPA, the Public Animals. Uh, they were making a bit of a comeback at one point, uh, but then it sort of died off, a lot of stuff happened. Uh, and then after that, the main one was BT or Bronx Team. Um, so I met those guys um, mainly through the painting of st meeting of styles uh, in New York and we just sort of hooked up from there and started doing quite a few walls. So being part of a crew is obviously quite an integral part, an important part of graffiti. How important is being a crew, being in a crew to you and how do you find it has helped your development uh, if it has? Yeah, it's kind of nice actually to be in a crew, I suppose. Um, I didn't really do a whole lot of it in Melbourne. Um, typically I've actually been much more of a solo writer um, and I've done most of my pieces by myself. I don't really like to paint with other people, typically speaking. Um, but Bronx Team, even the public animals, both of them obviously very important to development. Bronx Team especially, especially Pace, BT and Jew and, and all those guys because um, they weren't doing just pieces when I was in New York. We were doing big walls, big productions. And so, you know, one of the things I learned from them that's really important, I think, is to think about the whole wall and to sort of control the whole wall. They don't just go and think about their piece. They think, what's in the background? Who's doing it? What's the scheme? How is it going to interact with the piece? And so coming out here and painting again solo a lot more, I've really had to think about every element of the piece. And I just wouldn't have really been doing that the way I am now if it wasn't for that. So I think you always learn from other people. And so if you've got a good crew that teaches you a lot of stuff, yeah, it's very important. How did you get put down in BT? Um, as I said, so we, we met at around the meeting of styles a couple of times. Um, and I had a wall out in Brooklyn that I sort of had an open permit for. And so uh, I invited them out and they came out and painted and then they started inviting me out to some of uh, their walls and so it just sort of happened from there. Are they still people that you keep in contact with at all? Or? Yeah absolutely mainly online so connected. Um, Jude BT the founder is not um, online he's not on Instagram in any case um, he should be but he's not uh, but Pace VT is and um, Abe and a bunch of the other guys are so yeah we still um, keep in touch through Instagram and so have you found it quite difficult to ha keep that com com stylistic conversation going with your crew even though that you're living in a completely different country as them yeah that I mean that certainly makes it harder um, I think the main way we all we would interact now is through the pieces right so every time we're po we're posting our work we're staying in touch with each other that way and sort of following what each other are doing online I suppose and so there's still communication in that sense um, in a way it's, it's it's odd you communicate more about the style now because that's the main thing that's being shared um, and so I don't think it's been uh, too detrimental or anything like that. So what would you say is your most interesting chase or beef story? I probably shouldn't go into the beef stories, <laughs> I'll avoid them. Um, I don't really do beef though, uh, I just sort of ignore people. I, a lot of people probably hate me, I don't really care. Um, I just, to, to engage in beef with someone is to actually recognise them. And so I don't engage in beef because if they have a problem, I don't recognize them. There is eventually, my strategy is typically, eventually I will just slash everything you do if you're going to keep going, right? Um, if, you know, if you're going to try and beat me up for something, you should actually have a reason. So that is probably a pretty good reason. Um, but I don't really typically get involved with beef. Um, I'm probably a bit too old for it now, to be honest. Um, don't have a lot of chase stories. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, I don't, um, I've typically painted solo and so um, that meant when I was doing things like trains, knowing the security schedules and, and things like that, I had to be very cautious in the way of doing that because I was doing it on my own. Uh, there were certainly a couple of cases where I've been interrupted and you know had to run out of a train yard and all that kind of stuff. There was one case when I was painting a yard near a, a high school, an old school that had been shut down and somebody at, at some point I was painting I'd put the outline up and I suddenly hear like war sirens going off and it turned out someone had lit a fire in the school and this whole building was on fire and I turned my head and there was just fire trucks cops barreling down the street and I ended up having to hide 
in these bushes for about three or four hours and took another hour to get back to my car and get out of there. So that was probably the most crazy sort of chase, you know, kind of story. Shifting, I guess, our attention more so to the positive moments, what would you say has been one of the best moments in your graffiti career? Or perhaps even, you know, a really significant milestone or achievement that you think you've made, you know, during your time painting graffiti? The best moment I I would say for me is getting to live in New York City for seven years um, and painting there on a regular basis um, and, you know, eventually sort of painting with you know, a lot of people who are probably well known in, in the graffiti world. I think a lot of people, they go to New York, they might visit for one or two weeks and they'll line up some walls and they'll do some pieces and that's great. Um, but to have the experience of actually living there and, you know, con- and being in the sort of graffiti community, definitely, definitely a, a highlight, probably the best moment. So what did you find were the main sort of differences between the scenes that you've lived in then? As in New York is this big centre and has such a lot of history to it regarding graffiti. What do you find were the, the different differences regarding uh, scenes or traditions or styles or just ways of going about what you did? It's, it's kind of a hard place to paint in some ways because it's all, it's, there's much more sort of politics involved if I can put it that way. So there's not, you can't just sort of, there's not many places where you can just go and paint a wall, right? You have to know people, they have to invite you, you have to invite them back. So things sort of started opening up for me when I got a big, pretty big legal wall that I had a permit for because I could, you know, invite people out and, and stuff. And so once you're in and you can paint walls, yeah, it, it is pretty good and it's, and it's really nice to sort of be there. But it's a harder place to paint. It's not easy. Like in New Zealand, in Auckland at least, you can paint a wall every week. You can, there's tons of places, well not tons, but there's places around town you can go and paint. You can't do that. It's not as easy to do that in New York in terms of the legal stuff. Uh, in terms of stylistic differences, I would say New York has wild style on lock still. I, you know, so just comparing back to the stuff and thinking about the stuff I used to see in Melbourne growing up, a lot of people tried to do wild style. And I look at some of that stuff now and I don't think it really holds up very well. But the New York writers, um, their, their wild style and sort of letter game and, and stuff is very much on point. There's a lot of very strong painters and, and so on. So can you sort of um, see how it's come to be that way then? Can you sort of see th- how that wild style has developed from living there, the atmosphere of the place, the kind of architecture? Can you see how that has fed into those styles? What sort of had my sense of New York graffiti is just the tradition it's like it's very much stuck to its roots um, and it's constantly innovated on on those on the fundamentals that kind of emerged around the train era and so I think that's what you see developing and playing out and being pushed on the on the bigger walls and stuff I totally agree there a lot of the stuff created during you know subway art and you know books like that you can see a lot of that style still kind of being translated and interpreted you know, in the present day, which is probably a good lead-in into the next set of questions, which is more about the influences and inspiration to your work. So, who would you say uh, you looked up to when you first started graffiti writing? Well, my main source of inspiration at that time was Subway Art. So the people who exposed me to graffiti, they were like, oh, and take a look at this book, right? Um, And so that was my uh, main inspiration and and so on. And, And in that book, I was more kind of taken by the bigger, cleaner stuff, the more straight letter stuff myself. Um, so, you know, the scene pieces were standouts for me, the Lee pieces and the Dundee pieces. That's probably a very conventional and typical thing to say, um, but that's just how I was exposed, and so they were the most impressive people to me. Yeah, cool. So you've sort of um, answered our next question there, which was who were your th- top three graffiti influences? Um, but why did those styles stand out to you more than, say, the sort of uh, technical wild styles of, like, Case 2 or people like that? I just always felt that the bigger, cleaner style had more of a visual impact. Um, And it's also something that I noticed a lot the importance of it when it came to doing big walls 
And one of the things I noticed with painting productions with other people was when you've got a 40 foot wall that's, you know, 15 feet high or whatever it is, and you get the photo of the whole wall, the wild styles often look like just bits of squiggle. They're very good, they're very sophisticated, they're very technical, but in the bigger photo, they're very hard to actually see. And so what I like about, I think, and this is why I think the cleaner styles, the more straight letter stuff appeals to me, is because of its visual impact and its visibility, especially from a distance. So it's all, for me, it's almost about the throw of the painting, I would say, right? Um, you need to be, a wild style is hard to look at. You need to be a certain a right distance from it which you're not always going to get in the image of it or, or whatever the case may be. So I think it's just about the clarity of it. You can see what the person's doing in a straight letter. It's easy to disguise bad style with a bunch of arrows. Right? So I think that's what, why that appeals to me. Having listened to what you've just said in terms of the types of styles and aesthetics that you actually quite like in your own work, could you actually explain to us um, how you actually arrived to what you currently paint now in terms of like the evolution of you know where you started yeah so i the 3d stuff that's probably the easier thing to explain because i can kind of clearly remember when i turned in that direction and it was when i was in new york and when five points was happening and five points was awesome i loved it um Mears is you know awesome at organizing it and running the place it was brilliant and you walk around this whole building and it was just piece after piece, you know. And so many people had these all this complicated stuff going on and and after a while that kind of becomes a bit of a blur. You start it almost as it's almost as if some of it starts running into to just becoming all the same thing. And so I sort of turned to 3D and sort of changed my style to try and produce something that stood out and was not the same as what a lot of people were trying to do. I also kind of thought because there were some people who could paint such effective wild styles, there was no point trying to compete with them, right? You, there, there's some people, their wild style game, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And I was like, wow, this is kind of a shortcut to being doing something that's different and sort of standing out. And so that's why I took that turn and why things evolved in a, in a more 3D way. From what you're saying, it sounds like there's an element of simplicity to what you do because you're referencing Lee and Dondi and the simplicity and boldness of their styles and then looking for a kind of easy way to um, do something original and be seen over the technical wild styles that were surrounding you. So a lot of graffiti writers tend to look for graffiti for inspiration. Do you, is that something you still do? Like where do you look for inspiration now? Is it from graffiti itself or do you look to outside of the culture as being someone who has done it for such a long time? These days uh, what's typically happening in terms of inspiration is I guess what I have is a couple of templates that, that I work from and this is going to sound weird I'm sort of looking at the paintings I'm producing to figure out how I can sort of push them and develop them how I can sort of push a line of flight to the next stage and so I'm that's sort of the that's the dynamic that leads me to produce more paintings so there isn't like inspiration in that sense it's what I'm trying to do is find the next logical step of what I'm painting and so there isn't inspiration anymore in that sense that sounds very sad to say it that way there isn't inspiration anymore I don't have it and I think I probably spend way too much time on Instagram where I'm scrolling through feeds and all my feeds are just graffiti so I think all that is somehow feeding into whatever I'm doing but you know as you know with those kinds of social media I think these things just all run into each other now and I'm probably stealing a ton of stuff from everywhere, but I'm not conscious necessarily of who or where it's coming from. It's, it's because the image is moving so fast past my eyes now. Um, but the main thing is to try and develop those lines of flight and those basic templates. That's quite interesting because I know that um, towards the end of last year, another thing that you had mentioned about your work was that you really enjoyed refining, refining, refining. 
and although that your pieces may look a little repetitive you know when you showed us like a comparative compa comparison between what you're doing in 2014 2015 2016 2017 there was a steady evolution and progression with, within your work so what in terms of the process itself what kind of advice would you give to other writers in terms of explaining how you work instead of just purely taking influence from other people's ideas and then kind of trying to mold and shape your work from everything that you see um, that's kind of external to you if that makes sense um so is this really the question about how to take influence without biting or is that something separate from what i gather you're saying that you develop your work by looking at your last piece right yeah. yes you do have external influences by the things that you see online but essentially you're still trying to refer to your own work to think about what the next logical step is to improve it so what would you say to other people that work quite differently to that you know they're constantly looking at things on instagram to think about how they can involve their work instead of looking at what you've already made which is in front of you and how to improve that yeah, I, I, so my process, I would say, involves being your own worst critic. It sort of involves hating a lot of what you've done, and it involves finding and really looking at the stuff you don't like. So my advice, I guess, for people who want to think about that is just you have to be okay with the process. You know, you have to accept that you're going to be looking at your own stuff to find what's not working, and so you need to be self-critical in those respects. Um, and that has a danger of putting you off because, you know, if you're just telling yourself you're shit and you didn't get that right, I can see how that might discourage people. So it might not be a strategy that's good for everyone, uh, but I think self-criticism is um, important. Uh, and I think, you know, I don't want to sound like too much of an asshole, but I think there's a lot of people that need to get over their ego. No one's that good, right? No, I'm not that good. No one's great. Right? I don't think anyone is special. Um, and you sort of need to accept that um, and just try and use it to improve your work. From what it sounds like, your style uh, has an internal logic to it. It's a sort of self-fulfilling um, and self-progressing thing whereby you're referencing each past piece and looking how to evolve that through certain stylistic elements to add towards you know its overall character um, so what i'm gonna add a, an additional component to this question what do you think are the three things that you're trying to achieve in your style at the moment and what are the three writers or movements within graffiti past and present that you are currently inspired by so I guess the three, some of the things I'm trying to, I don't know if I'll get to three, um, but some of the things trying to do in the pieces is um, always trying to improve the technical proficiency of them, always trying to get things cleaner, sharper. Um, the second thing I would say that, you know, I'm always sort of trying to do is think more about shading patterns and different types of depth effects. Uh, and diversifying the way in which a piece is given dimension uh, so details what kind of details are you adding and so on and then the third thing I would say I'm trying to do is um, think of more more basic ideas that can be evolved and pushed and trying to make better choices about what template to kind of push right what sort of path should I go down because uh, some paths to go down can take a very long time, and so you don't want to make those mistakes, right? You don't want to go down a path that's not fruitful. And so I think that's the third thing I'm trying to do, is identify interesting possibilities in what I'm painting. So in terms of uh, inspirational sort of what I'm looking at for that, I'm, I, I would say like I'm more generally interested in anyone who's painting with depth and using shading techniques. So anywhere where that's happening in the graffiti world, that's probably of greatest interest to me. Is there anybody that's doing that at the moment? Yeah, so some, I guess, so some of the more concrete stuff that, you know, to put it that way. Um, yeah, Odate. I'm not quite sure how you say it. I was just in Lisbon. Someone explained it to me. It's sort of Odate um, or something like that. Yeah, brilliant stuff, obviously. Um, all the usual 3D suspects, you know, um, 
uh, Peter, Yama, those sort of the Italian guys. Um, probably my, my personal and my favorite 3D painter is probably Made 514. I feel he's very mis or non recognized in some respects. Um, maybe it's, I don't know why that is, um, but he is absolutely amazing, I think. Uh, and then a lot of the people in New York that, that I was painting with. So I think K.A. is another one. He's been pretty influential. I really like K.A. Um, again, a, a, an under-recognized writer, but brilliant. Um, Hef as well in New York was great. is great. Um, he does a lot of commercial work, so you don't see him doing too much graffiti style, but he plays around with a lot of depth effects, a lot of shading patterns. So from looking, from your, looking at your piece uh, today, uh, you obviously mentioned earlier when we were talking that you normally spend uh, a good few hours painting and we had sort of constrained you to two hours today. Um, but referencing what you were talking about earlier where you speak about Lee and Dondi and these really simplistic styles that give uh, an immediacy and a strength to you know, being noticed. Today it was quite nice to see that simplicity and um, technicality find a nice unison because the piece you painted today was... Uh, simplistic in terms of your overall style but it had these nice technical elements that you, you infused into it there was a nice sort of balance between the two elements um, are there certain things that you're trying to condense and take with you from piece to piece that you can just add in as and when such as these sort of grapes or I'm guessing they were grapes anyway um, those are berries as they were what things are you trying to move from piece to piece that you think um, are the strongest? I think a lot of that for me is just trial and error and so I think at this point a lot of the pieces have um, some pretty predictable elements and I would say they've more gone on to become sort of signature things perhaps. Um, so I, I don't know how I got onto water drops, I just discovered they were very easy to paint and just looked effective. Um, and then I thought, okay, this is a bit too much, something else needs to happen. And so, I, actually the grapes came from, I did whole pieces like that, so actually they, they, they all actually feed into one another, right? So this is how the thing sort of develops. So I started off with water drops because I thought, okay, so in a lot of 3D you get these flat planes on the sides of letters and nothing on them. And so I thought, oh, you can you should have more dimension. And you can have more dimension in these 3Ds by putting things like drops. And so then um, I thought, oh, what about a whole piece just made of droplets? And so I did a couple of those. And then it was like, oh, what about just portions of the piece of a of a agglomeration of droplets all coming together? Uh, and so they have a a certain kind of uh, evolution to them, I suppose you could say. So I guess I guess what what I'm trying to do in some respects is create um, signature little elements, I suppose. In terms of, you know, maybe for yourself and also, I guess, advice for other writers, there are so many trends, movements and styles and techniques and things that um, maybe intentionally or subconsciously are always influencing us. How would you, how do you take influence from all the things that you see without being a biter? I think the strategy, the strategy I adopt is I try and think, when I see a piece that I like, I think what is the principle that went into this that made it so effective? Why do I like it? What, what is happening here that's making it work? And I try and steal that principle and apply it with what I'm, with what I'm doing instead of trying to take a particular element of someone's piece. So I think you need to engage with people's work and you need to think about what is the principle that governs what this person is doing? How did they get there? And that's what you need to take. That's what you need to, to learn from people. Um, but I think what happens with a lot of people, they see something they like in a piece and they just replicate it, right? But it's more about taking the principle and applying it with the sort of direction in which you're going. So I think that's the better way, perhaps, to take um, inspiration from people without stealing what they're doing. In fact, well, and the other way to sort of think about that, I, when I look at graffiti now, I increasingly think, okay, if this person has done it, I can't do it. I need to think of something else to do. 
So that for me is a form of inspiration. It's about things get ruled out by default because somebody else has done it. So there's inspiration in that sense too. So that uh, comes from you know knowing your style uh, in and out. And it's interesting to hear what you say about that internal logic of your pieces, you know, paying attention to your work and somewhat solely your work uh, and not spending your time on in books or on Instagram. So checking out other people, but spending a lot of time, you know, in solitude with your style, looking at where it's going and how it's functioning. So given that, what keeps you motivated to keep painting after, you know, after so long? I would say it's because of what happens when you do that. You kind of think you've hit a end point, right, sometimes. Um, but then what happens is something new pops up. And so the motivation to me is to just see where it goes. Um, and like I say, you, you kind of need to have faith in the process. You need to assume it's going to work. And you can see it working when you make year-to-year comparisons or something like that. Um, it's one time I heard someone describe a, that game of, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's when you build up the thing with sticks or whatever, and eventually it topples over, and whoever... Jenga. Jenga, that's it. Thank you very much. And the way they were describing it was, you think it can't get any taller, but it just keep, it can. It's, it's bizarre, right? And I think that's kind of what motivates me, is the sense that it can keep going somewhere and it sort of does and you don't see it when you're in the process but you might see it when you stand back from the process. So I guess in saying that as well um, in terms of where you've kind of developed your work so far there is an integration of you know 3D practice 3d writing and letter forms and you're doing bevels you're doing all these extra effects and with rendering and shading and light have you reached that point to where you want to get to is there more to push and and where do you see your styles essentially going or you where, where do you see your graffiti going in the next five years yeah so in the next five years um i like i'm always wanting more cleanliness <laughs> and more technical sophistication. Not that I think that that's important, but I think you need it in a lot of ways to produce something that's good. I would think the other thing that would happen is opening up new templates in some ways or opening up new basic ideas to develop. Um, so that would be the main five-year plan. When you say templates, what do you mean by that? Oh, sorry. So a template for me would be like, like a basic outline, right? Like a basic idea that you just extend and extend and you push the implications of it. Maybe you open up a new connection, maybe you shade it in a different way, um, maybe you combine some of those templates at some point, but I just sort of mean a, a basic idea, almost a basic sketch, you could say. Well, that brings us nicely onto the next uh, section of our interview. So, Graffiti is evolving quite fast, and it, you think it is important to stay relevant with current stylistic trends. As in, there's big movements in Eastern Europe in terms of the naive style graffiti, there's a lot of bevel work going on. Um, are these things that are important to you, or secondary to what you do? That's a hard question to answer. Um, I've kind of just said that you should try and ignore people. <laughs> Um, but I, yeah, I think you want to keep up with trends in some respects, right? Um, it's always good to know what's what's going on, um, and and if for no other reason than to try and find a path that hasn't been taken before, perhaps. Um, but I also think it's important in the sense that some things really fall out of favour, and so I think sometimes you have to make a decision about: Are you okay with this falling out of favour? Is that good? Um, because you know you don't want to be stuck painting in the way people were painting 20 years ago if it's just not cool anymore. What, what do you think about people that like painting that type of graffiti? You know, like it's like a homage, right, um, to that particular aesthetic. You know, that was created 30, 40 years ago. You know, with stock caps and real shitty paint. And I mean, what do you think of that kind of level of appropriation? Appropriation. So if you're talking about people who deliberately try to re reproduce what was done in the past, I mean, each to their own. If that's what, if that's what you want to do, go for it. That's, that's good. That's up to you. 
um, but it's not for me. If if I saw a final outline, for example, well, if I saw a final outline, I'd be a bit iffy about it. Um, but if I saw a final outline painted with a stock cap that was all blurry and fuzzy and lots of overspray, I probably wouldn't be too into that kind of piece. So referring back to this kind of internal logic um, and self-processing element of your style, so are these things that you explore outside of purely painting on a wall? Do you sketch them? Do you kind of run through them in other mediums? Or are they things that you simply evolve in the space on the wall? Um, so what happens now in terms of my process is I freestyle, but I'm drawing... To, uh, so what I'm, what I'm sort of doing, there is sketching, but I'm usually just sketching a small part of a piece that I want to develop or push further. And, and, but at the wall, I'm freestyling now. I used to paint a lot from a sketch. And one of the things that I started noticing with that happening was you get constrained by the sketch and you're, when you're trying to reproduce something you've got on paper, the minute a line is at a different angle or something like that, the rest of the sketch can be thrown off. And so I've gone to more freestyle because I feel you have to be interacting with the lines you're actually putting down on the wall. So I've gotten rid of the sketch, but I'm rehearsing the painting by sketching beforehand, if that makes sense. So in saying that, how often are you actually uh, sketching and how often are you actually painting as well in terms of translating some of those ideas onto the wall? So the painting, um, I have a rule of trying to paint at least once a week, if not more. So a minimal. So if I don't paint for the week, I feel um, bad about myself, let's put it that way. Yes, it's, it's not good. Um, sketching th pretty much throughout the week in all my little odd bits of um, throughout work. So if, I probably shouldn't say this, but if I'm at a work meeting, I'm sketching. I'm listening at the same time, but I'm sketching, right? I just finished a PhD student who she thanked me for all the sketches on her returned work. So that gives you an extent of how bad the problem is. I'm drawing on student work because we're sitting there in a meeting and I'm reading her work and I'm sketching. And I was like, I have to apologize to people. I'm like, sorry about all the little bits and you know doodles on, on your page. It it's, doesn't mean anything. I, I like the work. It's, I was just drawing. So quite a bit. It's, it, it takes up all my in time, my, those little moments of time where nothing's happening. Are you finding inspiration in the things that are around you? So if you're sketching all the time, are you looking at angles? in the external environment, such as pieces of architecture or little bits here and there where you're going, oh, that's quite interesting, maybe I could take that and, and run with it and put it into this, or, you know, is anything coming to you, is there anything specific that you're noticing in the environment, in your daily life, that is adding into your style? The physical environment is influencing me. I'm typically looking for how light interacts with physical objects a lot of the time. And I'm often looking at things like contours within physical things. So like um, one example that comes to mind when you ask that is on planes, um, the chairs might have like a bevel in them or something, right? So I'll be looking at that trying to think, oh, can I put that into a letter? Can I steal that, that shading pattern? Will that work in a piece? So I think the physical environment is definitely something I spend a lot of time looking at, especially for how light interacts with objects because I don't make any sculptures. A lot of the 3D painters that people are familiar with, um, I know a lot of those artists, they're artists and they make sculptures and then they photograph that sculpture under certain lights and that's how they get it looking so photo real. Um, I would say I'm a graffiti writer, so I just work um, from sketches and I'm just painting, right? I'm not sculpting anything. So it's not photo real, it's 3D. Um, but I am taking inspiration from yeah, physical objects and light and how it interacts. In terms of referencing some things that you see in the public space, where do you get your ideas for colour combinations in terms of your pieces? Because I see that you do use a range of different contrasting, complementary colours, but there's often light sources and all these kind of variations of colour. So how do you come up with that? Is that something that's planned or referenced off something you've seen or completely freestyle? The colour combinations are... I spend a lot of time looking at colour charts from spray paint companies 
and the color wheel. So that's where they come from. And I guess the question is, you know, one of the things about that is how do you choose the color scheme? How do you put it together? And I like a lot of a lot of the 3D stuff. It's if people, if someone is doing a blue piece, it's all blues. And I, at some point, some of those 3D start looking a bit um, not boring to me, but not very interesting. And so one of the things I started doing was thinking about um, just working in tonal ranges. So forget about the color, just focus on the shades. And so where my main light source is, I've gone to like, typically I'll use a tonal range for the light source and then a different tonal range or different color for the dark side of the piece or the underside where the light is not directly hitting it. And I like to make contrasts there. So I've been doing that for quite a while. Um, and then I'll offset that contrast with another set of contrasting colors, typically speaking. Lately, what I've been doing is varying even that and having more of a sort of, um, I don't know how you would describe it, like a, a very similar color range acting as the base, but a, a shift in it. So for example, there might be blues that do the highlighted sections of a 3D and then some dark greens on the base and it just gives it this little subtle breaking up and then a contrast color on top for some of the details. So, but to, main, to identify those, um, I look at the color charts and I use the color chart. So given that so much time and planning goes into your work, what are your favorite brands to use? I have a rule which is you should, I mean in this day and age you should be able to do anything with any of the current paints available and I paint a fair bit I suppose and so they've all become, it's all kind of the same to me now, I probably shouldn't say that, um, but being in New Zealand I've gotten used to iron lac, um, the actual can, I think the, the actual can is quite good, what you can do with it, I think you can make some really interesting tapered lines, um, the way the can spits uh, is very useful, um, but you know, if I can get my hands on the European paints, then you know, I love those too, um, so I like I like all of them basically. Um, I like the different color ranges that are available, the different things you can do with the can. One of the things I would say is it's more important to figure out what the can is doing. Every can reacts differently or in, for the, in some ways, right? And so you need to figure out how it's coming out, the pressure which is coming out, and you need to interact with what the medium, what the technology is doing. Um, in order to utilize it most effectively. Having used iron lac for the majority of the time, I guess, since you've been in New Zealand, um, what are the three main caps that you use to actually paint your 3D pieces? Yep, so I'm actually down to three caps. Um, so mainly the New York fat cap for a variety of reasons. Um, the speed, it speeds things up uh, and it makes things clean. Or you can use it to get very clean lines. Uh, my second level cap would be the universal cap, which is the yellow see-through one. And then my third cap would be the grey dot for detail and more fine work. So um, 3D differs from normal graffiti in the fact that it's, it requires a lot more um, use of gradients and tone and shading. So what are the main techniques that you use for your 3D pieces? So the main techniques on a, on a 3D for me at this point, I've changed it around over the years. At the moment, I'm trying to work more from the darks up to the lighter colors uh, and then adding details on top. Uh, it's a lot of, I guess it's a lot of can on the side, uh, things like that um, to get those patterns. What, I, what I've also started doing, I suppose, is actually trying to shade less and having solid panes of color and so it just depends so in 3d the typical thing to think all the time is to shade but if you've got thin lines in parts of it you probably don't actually want to do that so yeah it's about figuring out when to shade when not to shade um, but it's a lot of I don't it used to be a lot of cutting back uh, now it's more just trying to drop in the lighter colors to build it up that's probably the main technique so shifting to a slightly different question, have you ever suffered any health problems from using spray paint? Because 
This may not be a really important topic to many people, but for me particularly, I always see a lot of people painting without masks, without gloves, um, they're not covering up, and I don't know if people remember that what they're using is toxic. To this point, I have not suffered any health problems, at least ones that I'm not aware of, um, or I'm not aware of any health problems. Um, but I've been wearing a mask for since early 2000s, constantly. I very rarely paint without the mask, uh, and I get the, a very uh, a mask that basically protects against everything. And I would advise spending a lot more on a higher quality mask. And I wear that indoors, I wear that outdoors as well. Um, and it's one of those things you notice how much difference it makes when you start wearing it. So despite using things that are toxic on the regular, we try and do this thing for years and years and years and years and years over anything else. Uh, so how do you find that you balance an obsession with graffiti um, and feeding into it with work, travel and family life? I'm quite fortunate in that respect. My work overlaps with the graffiti in some ways, um, so they, they interact. Uh, the travel also interacts with work and, and graffiti. And family, I think my partner has known from day one that I was a graffiti writer and this was kind of what was in store and she was okay with it. Uh, and I guess the other thing is I have three three things in my life. It's graffiti, my work, and my partner. And so I only have to balance those three things and they all ov overlap, so I'm, so I'm lucky. There's not too much else that I really care about. I don't care about going out and buying shit. I don't care about getting drunk. I don't do any drugs or don't really drink alcohol or anything like that. So these are the only sort of things I have going in my life that makes it sound very sad but I'm actually very happy about that because they're the things I care about and they're the things I do. Um, so is your partner supportive of your nefarious lifestyle? Generally speaking she is. Uh, every now and then she perhaps gets a little worried about some of the late night stuff but typically speaking yes. If there were some writers that wanted to link up with you here from here from New Zealand would you be open to painting with them? Or, or do you want to continue kind of painting you know, on your own? No, no, I'll paint. i paint with anyone. Um, I don't have the, you know, some people they won't paint with that person, they, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't, I don't do that. I, I'm happy to paint with anyone. They can probably just message me through Instagram if they wanted to do that. Uh, and if they're cool, that's cool. I think in this day and age with all the, mainly I'm doing legal stuff now, right? And so if it's legal, it's not really an issue. Um, painting you legally might be a different story. Um, I'd probably want to paint with you legal a few times just to make sure you're not a dick. Uh, but you know, if you're cool, that's cool. We can we can paint. I don't know that anyone here wants to actually do that, but anyway. <laughs> so having moved around the world quite a lot, what are your thoughts on the current New Zealand graffiti scene? I think everyone on the Real Time web series has had negative things to say about New Zealand graffiti scene at the moment. So I'm going to be different and say I actually like it. I think it's... You're so controversial, man. <laughs> no, well, that is controversial. All, all the other bigger names that have been on here have dissed it effectively, right? So, um, so I am being controversial and saying it's not that bad. Um, it's great in the sense, like I say, compared to New York, it's great in the sense that you can just go and paint right like it's harder to do that in some places so it's great in those respects uh, i think you've got a lot of people here with a lot of talent who do really interesting things um, the problem is they don't paint enough right so there's some people in this city country who i'd love to see them doing more stuff so i, I generally think it's it's quite good it's got a nice balance like every graffiti scene you're going to have you're, you're better writers, you're going to have the ones that are more in the middle and you're going to have some that are sort of up and coming and so they're not so good. I mean the downside I would say to the New Zealand scene at the moment, which is probably not pe peculiar to New Zealand or, or Auckland, is I think there's a lot of people who are just focused on doing quick pieces and they're, you know, they're comfortable doing what they're doing. They spend an hour or two and that's pretty much it and so that's a bit of a downside to it. So how do we shift that culture? I've got no idea as to how to, how to shift that culture. It's a very hard, hard thing to do. Um, maybe... We've got all the best paints, 
we've got all the connections, all the networks in terms of being able to connect with other writers. You've got every possible thing that you could find on the internet in terms of influencing your aesthetic and coming up with ideas. Why are we not working harder? Well, I guess the path of least resistance is the one that most people want to take. I, I mean, I think, you know, maybe we should take... A, sorry, you're not going to like this, but um, take away the Astro Fat Cap, right? Like, okay, skinny caps are okay. It's okay to use a skinny cap every now and then. I just think, pe- I, I think people are looking at, you know, a, a lot of it is about speed painting, so on and so forth. I think it's about, you know, trying to develop something different. Um, try and spend a bit more... I, maybe that's this. Maybe it's like pieces get painted over pretty quick, right? And so why spend a couple hours or whatever the case is? Why spend three, four hours on a painting that's probably not going to be there the next day? Whereas for me, it's like, well, the finished piece today is the photo, right? So you're painting for your photo. And I don't know, I think that's pretty super obvious thing to say. So go all out on the piece. I think people want to conserve paint. They, you know, think it's not going to last. And it's like, but that's not what it's about. It's not about, you know, the piece lasting 50 years or whatever the case is. It's about documenting the best thing you can do at that point in your career. And so I think it's the perhaps the mindset or the attitude. And maybe I mean maybe people involved in graffiti for those reasons. And so there's probably not a lot you can do to change those people. Maybe it's a an age thing, maybe it's about how long you've been painting and so on. So given that, how would you say do you become a successful writer and do you consider yourself one? With success, for me, it's two things. One, and this is not just graffiti, one, it's organisation and two, it's persistence. Um, I think it's as simple as that. Uh, If you want to be successful in anything, you need time management, you need to take it seriously, you need to do the work, and you need to be persistent in doing it. You're not going to produce any, maybe you will, but it's unlikely you'll produce anything mind-blowingly great the first two or three times you try something. You need to kind of stick with it, and you need to kind of think long-term. As for whether I'm successful, that's a hard question to answer. Um, personally, in terms of what I've wanted to accomplish, yes. Like, for me, right? I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm happy with what I've done so far. Whether success means in terms of other people recognizing that, uh, that I'm not so sure. Uh, but personally, certainly. Do you actually make a living from doing your graffiti? No, I don't, and that is by choice. I don't actually want to monetize or turn my graffiti into a commodity or anything like that. I'm not trying to make a living. I have no interest in doing it. My basic reason, I don't, if people want to do that, that's fine. It's, it's not a critique. I understand why people would want to do that. Uh, but just for me, I don't want to deal with clients. I don't want to deal with um, having to negotiate with people about what to paint, when to paint, and, and all that kind of stuff. Is it possible to make a living from doing graffiti? I think it's possible to make a living from graffiti. Um, I think you're going to have to compromise a lot. Um, So if at that point it's still graffiti becomes an open question, I don't think people generally want to pay for um, letters and, you know, anything that looks like typical traditional graffiti. So I think it's going to be very hard in those respects. That's I don't think that's right, but I think that's kind of the reality of the world we're in. How would you define a real writer and are people additionally who make money from their graffiti still real writers? So for me, I guess a real writer would be someone who's dedicated, someone who's um, consistent, I suppose. That's, that's That's a weird question. For me, actually, a real like what I I would think I there was a, there's a definition of this I can't remember where I heard this but um, a real writer is someone who's prepared to take risks and try something new within graffiti I suppose that that holds um, so anyone who sort of does that you know that would be kind of authentic to me I suppose you could say on the opposite of that what do you think classifies someone who is not a real writer and what do you think shouldn't belong in graffiti. That's a hard question to answer. For me, I guess graffiti is typically about um, letters and a certain kind of aesthetic. And so things that are outside of that would not typically be 
um, graffiti. I don't buy too much into legal illegal divides. For me, it's more of an aesthetic category. Um, and so real versus sort of not real would depend on what kind of aesthetic people are producing. I think in different generations of graffiti, there's going to be different types of attitudes and values that each kind of generation holds. Um, and I'm sure the definition of what a real writer is 40 years ago is very different to what it is now. So do you think that the you know, so-called rules and attitudes and um, you know, approaches to graffiti that were created you know, in the early 70s, should those be the same type of rules and attitudes that we have today? I think if a rule, I sort of judge a rule by its consequences and its utility. <laughs> so the rules and attitudes from the past that still work and are still good, I think we should retain them. And for me, that would be some very basic fundamental stuff. Um, pieces go over tags and throw ups. Better pieces go over worse pieces. And you should, I, I think one of the rules is you should compete through style. Um, and if you can't compete on that level, you shouldn't be in the game. So what do you think about writers that say, oh, if you don't paint trains, you, you know, you're not real or you just do legal wars, that's gay. No, I don't, I don't buy into that. Um, I think you've got different ways to paint graffiti and I think you need to paint in light of what approach you're taking, right? So if you're painting trains, then there's certain expectations that come with that. If you're painting walls, there's, again, certain expectations that I think come with that. Um, you get a little more freedom on a train, right? Because by default, anything's going to look okay on a train. But there's still shit panels, right? Just because you're painting panels doesn't by default make you good. I know a lot of, see a lot of people, the panels are garbage, right? It's just shit piece on a train, big fucking deal. And the same with walls. Like, if you're going to paint a legal wall, paint what you can paint at a legal wall. Don't go and do a fucking throw-up because it's not the space for it. You want to do a throw-up, go trackside or go hit a train, right? So, again, I think the, you know, I judge it by the aesthetic. Uh, and I don't care whether it's legal or illegal. A shit aesthetic is a shit aesthetic. A good piece is a good piece, right? And you might calibrate that judgment according to where it is, the space it's in, but I don't, I think that's the, I think that's probably the more important logic. Where is the most interesting place that you happen to have painted? The most interesting, probably the European cities that I've been in. So I think I've painted Prague, uh, Lisbon a couple of times, um, Skopje, Macedonia, Vienna, and they were all kind of awesome for different reasons. The European cities, you know, better access to paint, better price point on paint, right? So better color ranges, so on and so forth. And then a lot of those places have legal walls and spaces all around the city uh, in which to paint. And so it's just awesome. If it's summer, it's also awesome, of course. So European cities, I think, are the most interesting places at the moment. Um, I've been going back to Melbourne quite a bit the last few years, and so I've gotten back into that. I do like Melbourne. I, I like it because I know the track size and sort of all the legal walls, so I can do a bit of everything when I'm there. So that's pretty interesting. So how do we get New Zealand up to scratch with these other cities that you're talking about that, you know, you like painting in? It's gonna, it's hard because um, the shipping cost of those paint ranges makes them very expensive um, so I don't know that we're ever going to have um, as great a paint range at that kind of price point that you would get in Europe um, simply because there isn't the market for it. I, what I would think, you know, I think one of the things to try and do is to get more uh, spaces and create more spaces where people can paint. I think one of the things that would be nice is to get more legal walls to sort of start forming more relationships with property owners uh, and trying to get space from them to allow people to paint productions. Uh, that would be some of the ways to, to, to improve. I don't know that there's a whole lot of graffiti writers who try to work with property owners or find property owners who might be interested in graffiti and sort of provide wall space. But that's, you know, I would say that's one of the things that saved or is why New York is still the mecca and still on the map because a lot of the graffiti writers went and found property owners to you know sides of factories and buildings and so get open permits on basically on, on a wall and so you just keep painting productions. 
So you're talking about European cities and the sort of freedom they gave you to kind of paint anywhere. Did you find that that made um, graffiti less interesting for you because of the freedom that you had to just move about and paint anywhere you wanted? Like, is the illegal side of it a motivating factor? Illegality isn't a motivating factor for me. Um, it might be for others, but not for me. And even painting illegally is doesn't actually interest me. Um, my, and I, I noticed this, like something had changed when this happened. On those occasions when I was painting, say, tunnels or something, or trains or whatever it was, when I got interrupted or chased, I was just annoyed, right? That was my main thing, was like, damn it, I haven't finished this piece, I'm going to have to go back another night, and I've left this unfinished thing on the wall that doesn't look good. And so for me, the primary thing is aesthetics, right? Like, does the thing I'm painting actually look any good? I don't... So I don't care about legal versus illegal. I care about what are you painting. Um, I actually think it's a bit of a problem for graffiti to embrace that idea of it has to be illegal to be real, right? Because I would say it's um, sort of typically it's anti-graffiti crusaders and politicians who insist that graffiti is illegal. So why would you accept that kind of worldview? right graffiti to me is about painting and aesthetics and if you insist that it be illegal then you're kind of playing into the game of people who are trying to stop you from being able to paint graffiti <laughs> again some people may say that's the motivation that's precisely the reason but um, i just think at some point you have to get over it and focus on what you're actually painting and delving into the next question which is i guess a little more about advice what's the best advice that you've been given by other writers or maybe a mentor you know when you started graffiti do you still have a mentor i don't have a mentor these days um i'm probably too old I'm master. i don't know about that i'm just too old um i think probably the best piece of advice is you know probably just try and be an original try you know don't copy people um, that's probably the best piece of advice i've got and i suppose you know stick it out like I think one of the things that graffiti does is it makes you very resilient and I'm sure there's been a lot of people who have told me you can't worry about what other people say, think, do, you know, you have to, you know, it's going to sound weird, you sort of have to be on your own path, you can't subject yourself to the ideas of others and the bullshit of others. Just additionally to that, what is the longest you've gone without painting and how was that? Do you mean since 1989? If you mean since 1989? Um, like I said, uh, there was a couple years off because I was sort of doing my PhD. So there's two or three years in there um, where nothing was happening. So that's probably the longest I've gone. But in that time, um, I was still sketching uh, and working on a graffiti project. But that was a very long time to go without graffiti. Looking at the bigger picture in terms of the scene here, specifically in New Zealand, what could... What could graffiti writers do to help grow the scene? I think they just need people, I don't know, I think just keep on painting, you know, try and try and travel, try and forge uh, international relationships, uh, try and sort of push yourself to do things different, um, try and get out of your comfort zone, try to be a bit more experimental perhaps. Um, I always, my sort of logic that I embrace a lot now is let's say I do a terrible piece I don't care because I'm going to paint something next week anyway right so um, just keep painting try to do different things over the past couple of years we've seen a massive increase in the popularity of street art what with the rise of the, what with the massive rise of Banksy and Obey kind of thoroughly um, influencing the mainstream um, art world's idea of these subcultures. So what is your opinion on these um, things such as street art and the rise of it and how it has affected graffiti? I think there's a very complicated relationship between graffiti and street art. Um, I would say that graffiti was largely responsible for inspiring street artists around the 1980s in New York and it often doesn't get credited for that and what I would say has sort of happened now is street art has gone on to become 
much more popular and publicly accepted. And I think, on the one hand, that's a good thing because what I think it does is it makes graffiti more publicly known or knowable and somewhat accepted. So people are now more familiar with art being in the public environment. So street art has certainly been good for those reasons. Uh, what I don't like about the street art graffiti divide so much is the way they get hierarchically organized. Typically, I would say by outsiders, people who are not in the culture. So things like the street art festivals, right, which it's always the same uh, kind of figures who are painting there, the same kind of people who are being invited, the same kind of image, the same kind of aesthetics, typically speaking, or, or you know, very sort of predictable things that are going to be painted at the next street art festival. And that often happens to the exclusion, I think, of graffiti aesthetics and graffiti writers. So I don't like the hierarchical ordering and the way in which street art has gone on to become privileged. Uh, I think it happens because it's essentially street art is like a popular art. It's easily digestible. Everybody loves a big cat on the wall. I love a big cat on the wall too, don't get me wrong. But it's like... You know, anyone can look at that and they get it, right? Whereas not as many people can get letters. And so, you know, you've got the, this divide that, that is sort of growing and this organization. And so what you've got is street artists who can, you know, take all the advantages that come with growing public acceptance, even though to some extent it's based on the history of graffiti. And the graffiti writers get become second-class citizens in this kind of art world, public art schema of things. So that aspect I don't like so much. That leads us on to our rapid-fire rounds. That's my, my gunshot. Blip, 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 blip. That's my uh, gunshot noise. So, several quick-fire questions. So, number one, have you been arrested? Yes. Number two, have you got in trouble overseas? Yes. Quality or quantity? Quality. Colour or chrome? Chrome. Murals or graffiti? Graffiti. Freight, panel or wall? I'm going to have to give more than one word. Back in the day I would have said panel. Today I will say wall. How many panels have you done? I did about 20 towards the late 90s, early 2000s, but then went overseas, so got cut short. Scariest place you have painted? I think any time you're enclosed. Best spray paint brand? Any of the better brands these days. In New Zealand, I will say for price point and what the can can do, Iron Lac is, has become my preference. Well, that pretty much wraps up episode 12 of the Real Time Web Series. Um, I really want to say a huge thank you to Kazam and Murdoch for all your time in terms of contributing to this episode. Uh, we really appreciate your perspective, knowledge, and obviously insight around your practice and thoughts about the graffiti culture. So I really believe that you've actually provided an incredible resource for all the writers and aspiring artists in New Zealand and overseas because you know the very intention for wanting to make this particular web series is that I don't believe that there is enough resources out there that provide at least an educational lens into what this culture actually is other than you know what what is already on the internet which is just like action videos of people painting so hopefully this actually provides people with something that's a bit more insightful inspiring and educative in terms of the people that have watched and listened so if you would like to see more videos like this make sure you subscribe to my channel and watch some of the earlier episodes which should be in the playlist and also drop us a like share and comment below and really let us know give us some feedback and recommendations on how we can improve the series and who you'd like to see in future episodes so stay tuned for more episodes of the real-time web series.